Welcome to Take Two with Tiffany Loren, the show where I'm reintroducing myself to the world as the full me, not just the mom or the YouTube sensation you might know me as. Welcome back to Take Two with Tiffany Loren, and thank you guys so much for joining me for another episode. As you know, we are going to kick off each episode with a review. And let me tell you guys, thank you so much for dropping these reviews and these comments, because baby, you have helped us chart top 200 on Apple Podcasts. Let's go, y'all. Thank you so, so much. So let's go ahead and get into our first review today. All right, today's review is from Miller ENT. Let's go. Okay. So excited. More and more of the world will get to hear your story from you. Proud of you, little sis. Thank you so much, Miller ENT. We definitely enjoy that review. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You don't know how much I appreciate those words. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and hop into the Try It With Tiff segment. Take Two is all about getting to know myself and incorporating self-care into my daily routine. So as you know, this portion of the show, I have to tell you about new things that I've tried and whether I like it or dislike it. So on this try with Tiff, I went to da, 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 Usher's concert. Oh my God, y'all. Let me tell y'all. Was it not amazing? Like Usher put on a show. First off, I don't really do concerts. I'm not that type of person. I'm not really a super fan of anybody. So when we pay for the tickets... I was questioning myself, like, is this really worth this money? Because we got really good seats, y'all. We was, like, literally touching the stage. Like, I could have reached up and be like, Usher, oh, my God, grab my hand. I didn't know, but I could have. So we went, and when I tell you it was everything and more, it was everything and more. The sets were so dope. He put on a performance. The man came out pop-locking and dropping it. I was like, okay, Usher, we see you. Still got the moves, baby. And, like, the three hours just flew by. He played all the hits. It wasn't any random songs that you didn't know. And I just want to give him a round of applause for really giving people their money's worth and really putting on a show there in Vegas. So if you have the time, I highly, highly recommend that y'all go to Vegas and see this man before this residency is over. All right, y'all. Next segment is Reality or Reddit. Now, y'all know. I'm here to tell my story, but you also know I got some wild stories up my sleeve. However, Reddit sometimes has even more crazy stories. So this segment is for you to decide, is this a reality or Reddit type of story? So let's jump into it. All right, y'all, here we go. I was dating this guy for four years. Three years into the relationship, he went on a trip to his homeland with his family. One night after he came back, he was drunk, and he told me that he cheated on me with a married woman. Apparently, she was way older than him. And he got her pregnant. She kept the baby and told everyone that it was her husband's baby. The woman is actually his uncle's wife. Oh, my God, this is juicy. So now the uncle is raising his nephew's daughter without him knowing. Is this reality or Reddit? All right, y'all, that was a Reddit. That was crazy. I know somebody who's raising their uncle's wife, son, daughter right now. I'm joking, y'all. I don't know nobody like that. But let me tell you something. This sounds like it should be on Maury. I don't know if y'all remember Maury or Jerry Springer, but this one's for the books right here. All right, you guys, so today I have a guest interview for you. And as we navigate this take two, you know that your girl likes to sit down with other people and see how they are coming along with their take two. So this week we sat out with Alicia from the podcast Triggered AF. Her and I discussed church hurt, protecting your abuser, and taking accountability as a woman. Y'all go ahead and grab that pillow and them tissues because, baby, it's going to get real crazy up in here. So let's go ahead and hop into this segment. Welcome to this segment of our guest interview. We have a very special guest today. Her name is Alicia, and she is the host of the Triggered As Fuck podcast baby let's get into that and let's tell the people what that is about because it sounds like it is about a whole bunch of stuff that we need to really know 
Listen, and I had to smack, you know, smack a little bit before we got into <laughs> it. So, Triggered AF, my co-host and I, Danny Bordeaux, shout out to you, absolutely love you. We were talking, it was literally middle of the pandemic. You know, they told us go home for two weeks, and two weeks turned into like three years. <laughs> and so, we were still at the house in 2021, and we were just talking through all the things that were triggering us, traumatizing us, how we were making it work with these men who we sometimes liked, sometimes didn't like, how we were making it work with my my child at the time because she didn't have a kid just all the things that were traumatizing us from family to relationships to just all the things and we were just like you know what we want to bring other people in on this conversation because we can either stay triggered sitting in our triggers allowing ourselves to be ruled by them or we can talk through them figure them figure them out and then tell ourselves the truth because you know in today's society telling the truth is like you are not supposed to do that <laughs> why'd you say those things <laughs> <laughs> if it is the truth you're supposed to keep it to yourself <laughs> And so we were just like, what if we started having those conversations out loud? I love and that's that. how it came about, Triggered AF. I love that because on this podcast, we aim to tell the truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, Listen. even if it's embarrassing. And a lot of it be ugly. Like, I really wish people would get comfortable with the fact that life is messy. It's not cute all the time. It's not pretty. It's not, oh, my God, the aesthetic. Yeah. No. <laughs> sometimes it's shit going up your back. <laughs> like, sometimes it's you peeing on yourself. Sometimes it's you making decisions that go against your own, you know, your own interests. Yes. That's what it sometimes looks like. So if we can start to tell ourselves the truth, we literally all can go so much further, so much faster because we, we anchor in ourselves in this good truth. What was one of your major triggers that was like, you know what? This is why we need to do this show. Baby, this story right here, Ooh, I can't shit. be the only one. Where do we start? <laughs> How much time do we have? I always say I look at my life um, because it has been a really traumatizing one. Like mm -hmm. I grew up super impoverished. Uh, we went an entire year without running water in our home, uh, six months without electricity. I was the oldest of three, then four. My parents, you know, my mom went crazy when I was really, really young. And so that meant as an eight-year-old, I had to figure life out. By 12, I had my first job. By 14, um, and by job, I mean, I started braiding hair because, you know, that, that'd be black girls' first, you know first business. <laughs> <laughs> by 14, I was cleaning houses. So... I've, I've lived through so much trauma. I was raised in a pseudo cult um, in that there were so many things that we weren't allowed to do. Uh, pedophilia was just a thing for us. Financial abuse was a thing um, in, in the religion and the church that I was in. And it was so, so hard. So I think the most triggering thing for me, especially because I was beat so much growing up mm -hmm. was figuring out how to love myself in spite of the immense hate I had for me. Mm, that's deep. Nigga. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. It's yeah. just crazy. Cause like you speak of all those things and it like builds your character, unfortunately. And sometimes people stay in that trauma yeah. and then they continue to pass it on to their children and yes. other things. Or sometimes people get a revelation from their trauma and say, you know what, like, damn, I've really been dragged, but, like, that dragon got to end with me, baby, because I can't continue to drag we on can't. to my kids and everywhere else. Everybody can't get dragged. Everybody can't get dragged. I have suffered enough. <laughs> okay? I did enough dragging for all of us. For all of us. <laughs> I did it. Generations to come. <laughs> exactly. I have been dragged enough for three lifetimes. So <laughs> when, when we were talking about triggers, it's honestly why I have... And maybe I need a little bit more empathy in that in that regard because I have very little patience for people who allow excuses to rule their life. Yeah. I don't understand it. Well, they say excuses are for the weak and Listen, incompetent. <laughs> it is tool, what is it? Tools of incompetence used to build monuments of nothing. Yes. Like I don't understand it. If you go through something, you can decide either I'm gonna sit in this shit, and you have every right to. Every fucking right to. You get to sit in your shit because it happened to you. It's painful. It hurt. It caused so much, you know, despair for you. You can make that choice mm -hmm. or... Or you can decide that, yes, this happened to me. It took that moment, but it doesn't get to take my life. That's true. And people are unwilling to move past it because it feels good to be miserable. Yes, Like, it if does. we keep it in a buck, <laughs> that shit feels so good to be miserable, to be mean, to be nasty. Mm -hmm. I don't know about y'all. Maybe it's my lower self, and I call, it, <laughs> I call that bitch Lola. Because <laughs> she's so low. She gets low. <laughs> low down. Um it feels good to be mean. And I know that's not the popular 
narrative. I don't skew towards just being a mean person, but if I'm if I'm keeping it a buck because we like to tell ourselves the truth, mm-hmm. it does. It feels good to like to sit and wallow. Yeah, it makes me feel so good. That's why misery loves company because ooh, it's like a, a spa bath. You can just so, start walling together. Ugh, just wallowing together. <laughs> And also, you can do the uncomfortable work of identifying, okay, why am I like this? Why is my first, because again, I was a fighter. I fought teachers. I fought men. Mm -hmm. I fought adults at what? I think 14 was my first fight with a teacher. Like, if people back in my, you know, in my hometown and in the church that I grew up in, if people didn't like my mom, they would fight me. Crazy. Like, I mean... 300 pound grown ass women fighting my little, and I'm little now. I'm like a buck 20 <laughs> on a good day after I done ate like Thanksgiving dinner. Like, you I'm think, light. Sis, you Damn, think, you I'm think. thick. You know? <laughs> but back then, I was, I was, you know, the, the very opposite you of slim thick. thick. <laughs> Listen, I was slim thick. And so you got these grown ass women who are mad at my mom, so they're physically abusive to me. And it was just like, yeah, I deserve to be pissed. I deserve to be angry. I deserve to air out everybody dirty laundry. And also, I can decide that you took those moments. Like, I don't have very many happy moments from my childhood. Mm -hmm. I can count them on my fingers. It's nobody's fault. It it was what it was. Mm -hmm. I can either focus on all the things that hurt me, that harmed me, that caused me to cry, that made me want to take my life uh, that that made me feel as though, you know, God hated me so much that he had me born into the situation I was born into. Or I can look at everything that I've been through and said, because of that, I can raise money in the instant. If I need $100,000, cool. If I need to build relationships to be able to position myself to uh, connect this or to build that, I can do so because of things that I learned being so fucking poor. Yeah, yeah, you get some good survival skills Listen. when you're down bad. <laughs> you get creative. You get real creative. If I need to, 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 to go seven figures or eight figures or if I need to bring a room together, I know how to do so because of all the lessons I learned by growing up in a hellish place. And on the outside, and people were like, oh, well, it wasn't so bad. And it's like, you're right, it wasn't so bad. But from my experience, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. So I get to choose which part of that experience I want to focus on. I choose to focus on the parts where I learned the most and grew the most. And so it triggered, for us, it's, we could all wallow if we want to, but who has time for that? You have one life. There is no, ain't nobody living to infinity. Mm -mm. At some point, we all have to die. And because we all have to die, I want to make the dash between year born and year died mean something. And that means I can't be stuck in this traumatized place. Nah, I want to frolic on the beach. I want to go find somebody's (laughs) son and or maybe daughter to enjoy. (laughs) To wallow with. (laughs) (laughs) To find some enjoyment because you get to choose. Life is about choice and people forget that because they're so busy lying to themselves. People do be lying to themselves and it is very intense. Like, this show was based around me going through my triggers and traumas yeah. and being triggered as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just like one of my biggest things is I had someone I had married at one point in time in my life. Like I said, like I have five lives, but yes, at one point in time. And <laughs> um, I'm on, that was my first life. This is my take two, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing with that was it's crazy because how you talked about like the church and some of the things you said I could tell was related to some of the traumas that you went through. Like that was a core base of it. And um, he was an individual that he was a preacher's son. So, you know, they was wrapped up and tied in the church, but the family itself and him was just so toxic. And a lot of toxicity came for that. And I was introduced to the church through him. So Mm -hmm. because of that, now my look on church is totally different. Like I'm almost so traumatized that like I don't even go to church because and that's okay it's just it was a lot for me and I feel like some of that issue of him hiding his sexuality came from the fact of like these rules and regulations of the church but then yeah. the danger in that becomes you're so caught up in living for something that's like this false sense of reality that you're now affecting other people and their livelihood and their emotions. You're abusing people, basically, yeah. like mentally abusing people and yeah. emotionally abusing people. 
even you know physically because it's kind of like you can't live in your truth because you're so tied down with all this church trauma really is what it is yeah. and now you yeah. bled it out into me and it's yeah. kind of like now i'm like i don't want no parts really because i'll be scared listen and that's okay for me i no disrespect to those who love listen i love the lord a hey, hallelujah and I'm not going to nobody church. I went to enough church for three lifetimes. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, <laughs> Monday at 12. Listen, Tuesday at 12, Tuesday at 7, Wednesday at 12, Wednesday at 8, Thursday at 12, Thursday at 5, Friday at 12, Saturday at 8. Every year for 18 years. That's crazy. I'm good, love, and joy. <laughs> and also, it is okay to say I don't want to be a part of an organized religion and also still love and honor God. Yes, I agree with that. Because the Bible also says God is within you. God is within you. Explore it. So I be exploring it. Me, the Lord, and my bed. And great <laughs> and our safe space. In our other. safe space. Because for me, it's not a place of refuge. Yeah. It is not a place of refuge. For me, the church has always been a place of harm. No, I agree with you. I, and I, I agree for my experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's all I can talk about from my experiences. That's all we can discuss. I'm not telling you. And I do believe that it it is so helpful for some people. And I love that for them. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord at the house. Mm -hmm. At the house. In the house. <laughs> we not. I don't want to. I want no parts of it. Because for me, the type of experience I had in church, there was so much pain and trauma even the first, the first man I ever really loved, um, he he was, and I, you know, never, you know, never tell a story that he's not ready to tell in terms of putting his name or or, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or likeness or anything out like that. However, when we were growing up, I knew from the time I was 15 years old that he was being molested by the person who was the head of the church. Crazy. And so, I understood very, very early on. First of all, because I always ask questions about the Bible because they're like, oh, God is such a kind person. It's like, but if you read a lot of stuff, he was kicking shit and taking names later. He was he was flooding <laughs> things. If the children disobey, <laughs> take them out into the streets and stone them like he was very angry in that Old Testament. Then I feel like he went to therapy and then he came <laughs> back in the New Testament and was like, OK, let's I was a little pissed off. because Let's he was, try this again. <laughs> listen, he was burning up Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a lot happening in that Old Testament. Testament side <laughs> and everybody he chose this is also too why for me I don't you know I have no desire to be deeply connected into church because every person God chooses has major impediments mm -hmm. if you look in the Bible literally every single person from David he couldn't keep his 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 little his little penis in I his was own. trying to find his little, little. <laughs> Listen, I was trying, he couldn't keep his stuff you know into the, the right people then he had Solomon, and Solomon could he had a thousand women. He couldn't figure out where he, whether he was coming or going. You had Moses who was murdering folks, like Rahab. She Jesus came through his lineage, and she was the head mistress. Like she was selling coochie, <laughs> left and right, baby. And not just her coochie, other people coochie too. <laughs> So everybody who God chose, she should have been madam. Listen, she was. She was a madam. Okay, she was sitting pretty. <laughs> Every person who God chose has a major impediment. So usually, in my belief, when they are, you know, high level leaders, they got some major shit that they working through. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to be a part of it. No, I mean, I agree with you. Because they also there. have this unrealistic expectation or these unrealistic um, uh, expectations and responsibilities that they cannot meet. But because they are the head, they try their best to meet them. And so that honestly probably what it was with your with your ex and that trying his best to 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 meet a level that is just unrealistic because he's he's born human. Yeah. I feel, you know, sometimes I feel bad for that part. I mean, and that's, and, but, but you know what? So, but that's where the empathy comes in. I can have empathy for you and still be mad as hell. Like, yo, you did me dirty. Yeah. Like my ex-husband was very abusive. I have all the empathy for him because of how he grew up. I understand why he was abusive. I understand why he is the way he is. I understand how he couldn't pull it together and figure it out. I get it. All the things he went through, I would be that way too. But if I, I can't went through all that, that behavior for I you. do not excuse it. And I do not allow and accept it as something that has to permeate through my experience mm -hmm. because you went through hell. Me too. Me too. But I'm not abusing you. Me too. <laughs> like, all the hell I done been through in this little life of mine, I'd be like, dang, am I really only 37? Yeah. Because a bitch has been through a lot. <laughs> like, I was telling my girlfriend the other day, we were just talking, and I was, I was talking about a situation that I, I had gone through, and she was like, bitch, how are you not psychotic? I was like, girl, it, at least $50,000 in therapy. <laughs> you be keeping me. <laughs> 
I have spent thousands in therapy because when you go through that much trauma so early, and we were talking about it earlier, once you have gotten past the trauma and you're now in a situation that is so much better, doing your best to not respond like that traumatized person is so incredibly difficult because it's like, nigga, all I know is survival. Yeah. Like, fight or flight. All, all I know, day. fuck a flight. <laughs> I'm finna fight. <laughs> I didn't know flight because I went, where could I go? Yeah. Where could I go? My mother, my father, my siblings, my friends. I went to the church school and the church. Where I'm flighting to? Yeah. Fight. That's, <laughs> That's it. I only got one thing to do, babe. I'm in the corner. Nothing Unleash if you bug. <laughs> Let's go. And I'm little too. And little people, it just seems like they just have the most, <laughs> all this energy <laughs> in this compact little body. So all I knew was fight. So to then go from being so incredibly traumatized to now creating Triggered AF and then getting into relationships. Because listen, after my traumatizing relationships, I was like, oh, hell no. Nah. Give me somebody who's gentle, okay? But then when you get the gentle, you be the you be the, you rough be the aggressor. You, now you the aggressor. <laughs> just as rough. You be like, dang, I ain't even have to go there. I like, ain't have to do that like that. Well, I do that. I'm so sorry. Now listen. they think you crazy. <laughs> not like, crazy. I got PTSD. <laughs> exactly. This is PTSD. I'm not crazy. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure my life out from here. But that comes with telling yourself the truth, right? Which is, again, something most people don't want to do. Yeah. Because telling yourself the truth means you have to now be accountable. To, you have to be accountable for your actions. You have to call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to say, I didn't do this right. And then apologize to the person that you may have done wrong. Or, hey, you know what? My bad, dog. And this is how I apologize. You know, women, though, that take a lot for us it to apologize. But so I apologize <laughs> to everybody. I apologize to my child. I apologize to my partner. No, I do, too. Because here's my thing. My ego is not so big that I want to hold on to it so much if, it, if I know it hurts you. Yes. Like, it ain't even that deep, dog. At my all. bad. <laughs> My bad. I know what that feels like, baby. I don't want you to feel like that exactly. one day. So it's cool. I, I messed up. I don't want to gaslight you and make you think <laughs> that I ain't really fucked up where I fucked up because I fucked Cause up. Because I did. My bad. And I'm going to probably do it again. Not because I want to or because I mean to, but because I am literally still growing and evolving and trying to figure out what PTSD looks like in such a peaceful space. It took me so long to figure out what peace looked like and how to operate in a peaceful space because I was so used to trauma and, and, and violence and yelling and screaming. When I created a peaceful home, because I didn't know what the fuck that felt like mm -hmm. in any facet, yeah. when I created a peaceful home, I walked in that bitch and started crying because I didn't even know what I'm supposed to do with all this peace. What is this? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Somebody call me and say something crazy so exactly. I can go off. <laughs> So I can feel comfortable again. <laughs> but that, too, is telling yourself the truth. Where do you feel most comfortable? Do you when, feel most comfortable when shit is on fucking fire? Yeah, if, when, so, if that's what you used to, yeah, you do. Okay, bet. If you know you also, too, don't like it, that's where I feel like as women, like, we got to start telling ourselves the truth. Hey, yo, we be making decisions that go against our own self and best interests. No, I, I agree with that. And then... You know, I hate to say it like this. I love my women. But then it's like, don't, you know, don't victimize yourself afterwards. You got to at least tell your part. Like, you know what? I knew he was shit. And I still went with it. And Listen. I thought it was going to turn out better. And it didn't. And you know, I fucked up. I just my messed bad. up. That's it. Listen, my bad. <laughs> tell yourself the truth. Like, people ask me all the time, because I'm very open with, with um, the abuse that, you know, I experienced when I was married to my ex-husband. Um... Like I said, I, I I lost my first child. I was 17 weeks pregnant, and I <laughs> caught him with another woman who was also pregnant at the same time, um, and the baby was his. So I'm pregnant, she's pregnant, um, and I catch them at, at, at the house that, that he was living at, and I guess he thought I was going to fight her, and I wasn't. I was going to be my teammate. We both sleeping with him without a condom. We teammates. <laughs> Baby, we on the same team. We on the same team. Out real fast. He's against yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I wanted to meet her, say hello. I guess he thought I was trying to fight her, so he grabs me and slams me into the ground. About three days later, I lose the baby. That's so sad. Heartbreaking. And it's crazy because my mother knew. She came to the hospital. Um, I'm, of course, you know, hemorrhaging. The baby is, you know, expelling itself from my body. And my mother says, I know he hit you. Just tell me. Just did tell me. Did you take up for him? I did not tell her. 
I did not tell her because I knew she would kill him. My mama, she a little off. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know the, the professional term. I call it crazy AF. Um, she ain't got them all. And so I knew she would have taken his life. And I was like, I will not allow you to spend the rest of your life in jail because I can't figure out my own shit. That's not your responsibility. And I will not do that to you. Oh, my God. I'm glad you said that because... You know, when I exposed the situation I went in, some of my thing was like, it's hard for me to expose what happened to me, even though it's my story and it's not a bashing situation, but a part of me still wants to protect my abuser. And it's almost like, why? Stockholm you, Syndrome? You ne- <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> you never protected me. So it's kind of like, I'm still tiptoeing around and people are not understanding why we have this type of relationship between us that we have because I'm still covering, but then the story ain't making sense. And then even like what you said, some people comment like, well, if I was your dad, if I was your brother, I would have did this. But I was like you, I'm like, I can't afford to affect your life because I got this situation over here because I know what you would do and I can't take no L with you like that. Yeah, And I also made a choice. I knew. So here's the thing. Here's the craziest, the wildest shit about that. And this is where honestly... Honoring your own truth, knowing who you were. My self-esteem was so low, I felt like that was the best I could get. And I actually married him after that. My 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 daughter, um, we had her after that. After I lost that child, I knew who he was. And like we were saying earlier, sometimes we make those choices and we know what it is. I knew who he was. But I was under the impression, and this was the part of the Bible that I just don't know how I feel about too tough now. Um <laughs> the love conquers all part it was a huh um I felt like I could love him enough that he would I could teach him to love me and so many women especially now like with Trigger, we have this course called Dating Well AF, where we teach women how to identify what you actually need and then date according to what actually works for you. Mm-hmm. Because 70% of divorces are initiated by women. And that number goes up to 90% if you are college educated, primarily because we date according to a clock. Mm-hmm. We date according to what physically feels good mm-hmm. to us. And we date according to other people's expectations. We don't actually make choices that align with the type of life and lifestyle that we want. That's crazy. So when it came to that particular decision and choice, I couldn't make anybody else struggle or suffer because of my decision because I knew who he was when I married him. And I thought that things would change because I loved him enough. Oh, my God. I feel the same way. That's exactly... Well, you know, when we got... um we was engaged, and like a, right before we got married, he had a baby on the way. And the, he was like, that's not my baby. And his mom was on the church. She's like, I prayed about it. It's a nice baby. And prayed it about ended it. up. Dana don't lie. Your prayers don't mean oh, shit. Baby, Dana don't lie. Came, and it ended up not being his child, but the abuse never stopped. And yeah. when I look back, I'm like, girl, you knew what you was getting yourself into. You knew. You just wanted to go off of the potential. You wanted to go off of yeah. his mama saying it's going to work out and it's, it's the church thing and you should try to make your marriage work. It's like, girl, I'm with a... I'm with Satan. You talking about church. <laughs> Baby, listen, listen. This is you, Lucifer. Yeah, I don't know what. You're not picking up on this spirit. <laughs> this is legion for they are many. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I think it's that taking accountability as women that sometimes, like you said, we lack. We know yeah. what we're getting into, and then we want to be like, I can't believe no, baby. I'm telling you, I can't believe. Plus, I'm going to tell y'all where I messed up. Listen, and that, too, is telling yourself the truth. I really, I am so hopeful that as we are going into this new paradigm, because clearly there's a paradigm shift. I mean, all the the the, the, clo- the skeletons in the closets are coming out into the open, mm-hmm. okay, to be among us all. And I, my, my earnest hope is in this paradigm shift that we start telling ourselves the truth. I made this decision because I did not like myself. Mm -hmm. I chose my ex-husband because I did not like myself. And so I selected a partner who treated me how I felt about me. He treated me like he ain't like me because I ain't like me. Because I ain't like me, baby. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Like, if we keeping it a buck, like, that's just what it was. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, now what it is, and even with our, our course, Dating Well AF, it's first things first, let's talk about you. Let's figure out what are your primary triggers, what are your primary traumas, and then who are you going to bring into as your MVPs to help you work through them because you start to bring into you whatever you're emitting. So if I'm only emitting good vibes, good energy, the men who come into or requirements, because I don't know why that's a thing now, black women aren't allowed to have requirements, Mm. fuck you. These are the standards. (laughs) These are the requirements. I said what I said. This is what I'm willing to accept. This is what I'm not willing to accept, and I'm not going to have a conversation about it. 
the guys who get it get it the guys who don't don't, don't next baby. item on the motherfucking agenda <laughs> but it's figuring out who are you and what do you need so that you can start to embody whatever that energy is and then you'll start to bring those people into the universe and the men who don't align or measure up baby they're not there for they'll reason. fall off anyway mm-hmm. but even the fair got requirements like you got to be this tall to ride this ride so why don't we have requirements do you have two tickets or no listen <laughs> yes or no <laughs> like what are we doing so no I, I i love the fact that you are so committed to to your truth and owning your truth and honoring your truth because people will get really upset with you for telling your truth I Bitch, know it's this delusional. is my story i know it's crazy how you mad at me for telling my story it happened to me you mad at me because i messed up and i'm trying to tell y'all I messed up and give y'all some advice on how so not to mess, mess up, up too. <laughs> that's like it. that's all i'm here for that's all it is and for the folks who are like oh but you're you're outing him no it's not outing him the people who mess with him know they know the they're internet aware. know baby it's on the internet too. listen they, know. they are fully <laughs> aware and if you wanted history to recount you better you should have been better that's it i get to tell my experience my story yes i will honor you and that i'm not gonna i'm not gonna drag your name and now if they do their own research that's not my business um i'm not gonna drag your name i'm 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 not going to do things to intentionally harm you but i will get free and tell my story and if that hurts you like we had to have this conversation with my father because he was so upset he's like why are you telling family business and i'm just like me telling what my experience was and how i grew up and how challenging it was for me helps to save my life because I had planned to take my life. January 2013, I had planned to drive my car off of the overpass coming from Fort Lauderdale to Miami. Mm-hmm. I drove an SUV. I knew exactly how fast to go to make that bitch flip so that I could end my life because I was so hard fastened on keeping my stories inside of me. Whatever you ignore magnifies. That pain that you ignoring on the inside of you, okay, keep ignoring it. Listen, it's like Lola, my lower self. Let me keep ignoring the fact that this bitch keep tapping like, hey, hey, I don't like this. This don't make me feel good. Eventually, I'm going to explode. The same thing goes for your triggers and your traumas. If you keep ignoring them, what it does is it will explode inside of you, and then you will start to do things that harm you physically or harm others physically. You will have to process those emotions. You will have to process what happened to you. You can't ignore it. No, that's beautiful. I think that your platform is really beautiful. I think it's very much needed. And I want you to let everybody know, Alicia, where they can find you. Yes. She's super cute, y'all. Make sure y'all watch these visuals. <laughs> she cute, cute. Um, you can find us everywhere all over uh, Beyonce's internet at triggeredafpodcast.com. Everything is there from our free dating quiz to figure out what type of data you are because you need to figure that out because the most important life decision you make is who you decide to make your partner. A lot of these triggers and traumas is because we keep connecting ourselves to people who mean us no good. So go on over to TriggeredAFPodcast.com and get your life. Just get your life. Well, thank you so much, Alicia, for coming on here. We're going to definitely have to have you back. Thank you for having me. We got to have you on Trigger because, girl. I'm coming, baby. The (laughs) thing. All right, y'all. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. And make sure y'all tune back next week. Now it's time for Therapy with Tiff. As you know, some weeks we'll sit down with my personal therapist and other times we'll bring on mental health specialists. In this episode, we have part two of Coach Q. Now, in the first episode, we got into some painful topics. And baby, when I tell you it was intense, it was intense. In this part, we're going to talk about forgiveness, forgiving ourselves, and most importantly, forgiving God. So let's go ahead and hop into this conversation. It's crazy that you talk about the God situation because (laughs) (laughs) I never thought of it like that, but um, I have a lot of church trauma Mm -hmm. because he introduced me to the church. His family was in the church, but the level of dysfunction Mm -hmm. that was like in his family and then through him and the crutch of the church that came behind it like Mm -hmm. the blaming of the church as to why i act like this and also as to why you should let me act like this and as to why you should stand by me through Mm -hmm. this type of abuse and the negativity from some of the people i was getting at the church just put a bad taste in my mouth to the Mm -hmm. point where it's like i've i have a relationship with god but then sometimes i'd be like do you Mm -hmm. because I don't want to, like, I can't step back in church Mm -hmm. and 
Like I find myself sometimes like my, you know, my current partner be like, Timmy, do you ever take time to really just thank God for like how far you come and like the stuff you have now? Mm -hmm. I'm like, not really. And yeah. you know, my therapist was like, Timmy, you need to kind of ask yourself, what is your relationship with God? And like, is it good or is it bad? And I told him like, I don't think I have a good one because I feel like I have so much trauma. Mm -hmm. And now that you say that, I wonder like, is some of that trauma, is some of that, like, I blamed, like, I blamed him for some of the stuff that happened mm -hmm. to me, because it's kind of like, why would you allow such things when it's like, that was a time in life that I was being the most true to you, mm -hmm. but it's like, but then all that came with it. Yeah. So, I never thought of it like that, but maybe it's like a situation where I do need to mm -hmm. figure out, is my relationship that tainted also, because, I mean, I just cringe yeah. at the idea of it now, like... Yeah. I don't want no parts of it. <laughs> right. And and I think that's a very honest thing, right? What you're saying is very honest. A lot of times we, our association and affiliation with God is church, mm. right? And so many of us, that was our introduction to the him and, and what we um, learned and where we fell in love with him. Like that was church. Think about even in your personal relationships, we have places, it could be a song that you mm -hmm. hear, a place that you went. And when you are no longer in that relationship, a lot of times you don't want to hear that song. You don't right. want to go to that place because it's associated with pain, right? And so the association of pain with God and with church is what has put a strain on your relationship. And what I had to learn how to do is to separate my religion from my relationship. The religion of it is, Oh, you're going to you're supposed to protect me and you're supposed to right. all of these things. But the relationship is that I know your future and because I have to allow you to go through this so you can be everything that you want to be. I don't understand you in hindsight. Mm -hmm. So I'm just looking at my right now. And when I started to embrace who he has created me to be holistically, that's when I was just like, you know what? I'm going to let this go, because if you felt like I was strong enough to go through that, even though it hurt me. I, you know what? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I learned to say thank you through it all. And a lot of times I was saying thank you and I didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. But the more that I said thank you, the more I was able to see me and the results of what I've been through. And it was more beautiful than the pain. But sometimes the pain can be so great that it overshadows everything else. And I had to learn that what I go through doesn't separate me from his love it's like a parent um i've talked to a parent who um child passed away mm -hmm. and she blamed herself because she allowed her child to go somewhere and at that time she was killed that because she allowed her to go somewhere and something bad happened to her that didn't discredit her love mm -hmm. nobody could look at that mother and say you don't love your daughter because you allow her to go that go somewhere so just because he has allowed you to go through something that has hurt you tremendously doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. And so even if church is triggering and you don't want to do that anymore, just engage in the relationship. Maybe, maybe the place is too much, mm -hmm. but you can still start at the relationship and start with honesty. I am angry at you for what you have allowed to happen to me. I didn't just go like, oh, thank you. No, was, yeah. I was mad. Like, <laughs> yo, why are you? Like, I was pissed. And I was just like, you know, people would say, don't question God. But then I was like, when Jesus was on the cross, he was like, why have you forsaken me? That's what he asked God. So if that's how he felt, why am I not going to feel that way? I when mean, I feel true. like I was, you know, hurt and, and he didn't have my back. Because that's what it felt like. No, I know, friend. That's exactly what yeah. I'm like. Yeah. <laughs> like, yo, you ain't got my back. <laughs> but that's a, it's a real thing. You know, it's a very real thing. And I think that we have to um, allow ourselves and give ourselves permission. Um, Dr. George, who's a therapist, he has this segment called I Give Myself Permission. And one of the most powerful things he said, I give myself permission to be angry because of what has happened to me. We always try to get past anger. Mm -hmm. But that is a feeling. And if we are going to get to healing, we got to feel everything that comes along with the path to it. Mm. 
That's the scary part. All the feels. Feeling all the feels is Ooh, scary. Yes. I don't know what them feels are going to feel like. You don't know. Here you are today. Got me crying on this couch. This is not what I came here for. <laughs> I didn't come here for these tears. <laughs> all right. So on your YouTube, there's a lot of videos that um, I was able to skim through. And there was some that stuck out to me. And can you kind of expound on yeah. some of those that you feel like would be important for the listeners? Yeah. So a lot of times when I go on my YouTube, I want to give people the reality of situations. Mm -hmm. We live in this microwave society that if we set out to do something, it's going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, when we make up in my mind that we're going to heal, we're going to heal right away. <laughs> like, it's all of these things that it's just not real. Like, I wish I wish I could have just made up in my mind that I was going to heal and the pain was going to go away. Go to sleep, wake up and like, oh. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't going to be like that. And I think so many people quit the journey of healing and progression prematurely is because they have a false sense of what the process is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's my job to tell the truth. It's my job to provide tools and insight to say, hey, you probably going to encounter this, but here's something that you may be able to use along the way. Because a lot of times is we see ourselves in people's success, mm -hmm. but the reality is we will rip, the pain is the mirror. Because I don't care who you are, your status, your race, you're going to encounter some stuff that's going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we are crying, woe is me. It's just because we don't have access to the pain that other people have went through to get to where they are. No, that's true. Because like you said, I think that it's so microwave now and everyone mm -hmm. looks at everything so easily and be like, I could do this, I could do this. You don't understand the struggles. Like, no, baby, you don't understand the trenches yes. that we've been through. <laughs> so that like, part. I do understand the struggle. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that you know that I know yes. I'm part of the struggle, too. Absolutely. Um, what do you think are some common things that people revert back to that you notice as you coach individuals? Like, yeah. I know you probably get a lot of questions. You get a lot of, you know, telling people what paths to go on. Mm -hmm. But then what do you see a lot of people fumble back and come back to? I think that. People always go back to mistreating themselves. Okay. So when we go through a process to become better, we improve in some aspect of our lives, right? Um, however, whenever something goes wrong, we are always so hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And our mentality about ourself will show up in our actions towards self. And a lot of times that comes across with even you might not even think it's being mistreated, it, mistreating yourself. It could be something as simple as self-care and giving yourself time. Mm -hmm. Because you've like, I don't deserve to be sitting down on this couch. I got stuff to do. I spent so many years doing X, Y, and Z. Now I got to make up for lost time. And what do you do? You mistreat yourself on the back end. Mm -hmm. Because you are penalizing yourself for something that you said you healed from. And so anytime it feels familiar, we go right back to those behaviors that got us back in that position in the first place. That's me. I be beating on myself, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't feel like I have time to do anything. Yeah. And I think that some of my issue with not having time, of course, I believe it's like a scheduling thing and just make sure I have the proper people in place and, um, you know, to do the stuff I need to have done. But I yeah. think a part of that also is... I've been in such a hustle mode since yeah. I left because when I left, it was like, I'm not helping you. You figure this out by yourself. I took the kids and I've kind of just been having to navigate between like either being homeless or surviving. And mm. I think that where I am now, people will look at me and be like, oh, you're successful. You have all this. But subconsciously, I'm still in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I will stress every month about meeting like our quota or whatever. And sometimes I feel like it's in a healthy sense of like, oh, this is just business and you want to see your business scale. And sometimes I think it's in a sense of like, I'm so scared to be poor mm -hmm. like I was before mm -hmm. that like I will like break my, I will pull up in the wheelchair yeah. with one arm to make sure whatever needs to be yep. shot. <laughs> Because it's like, they might be like, ma'am, you need to be at ICU today. I'm like, ma'am, I need to go shoot. Yes, I'm out yes. here pulling up because I'm so scared mm. of going back to what it was or losing everything yeah. or just having to struggle with my kids like I had to do before. Mm -hmm. And I think that that also takes away from me sometimes enjoying right. the moment. Like you, sometimes my partner talked to me about like, you know, Tiff, we have all this stuff and you don't even enjoy it because I'll be like, we can't go on vacation because we need to do this. We can't mm -hmm. do this. We need to do this. 
And I think I'm starting to get to a point where it's like, I want to have balance. Yeah. Like, I want to be able to be like, I'm successfully scaling and continually. Mm -hmm. But I also want to be like, I'm enjoying the fruits of our labor, whether that's like taking a monthly trip yeah. or doing a trip every quarter with whomever just to be like, this is what we're working so hard for y'all. Like we're working hard, but we're also enjoying what we're working for. Cause Absolutely. right now we're working hard and mom is just like, Burn we need to work harder. <laughs> Listen, it's, You said something about survival mode. Um, one of the things that I talk to my clients about is I call it dying in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And that is so oxymoronic. Why would you call it survival mode and then say dying in survival mode? And what happens is when we experience trauma, there are some things that we have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. However, when it is time to dissociate from those survival mode tips or practices, if we stay there too long, we do more harm to ourselves and we end up dying. Parts of us begin to die in survival mode. So let me give you an example. I'll first give you a practical example. Okay. If you go into ICU and you're on oxygen, at some point they're going to start to wing you off of that oxygen so that your lungs don't become dependent on it and then don't know how to work without the intervention of oxygen from a machine. Right. So they wing you off to strengthen your lungs along the way. Now let's take it to a practical sense. When we first encounter trauma, then we might stay at home all day and isolate ourselves and lay down because we're just in a lot of pain. We don't have right. a lot of energy. Well, if we continue that practice, we take ourselves down the path of depression. And with that, we begin to start to die emotionally and mentally because to, depression will rob us of love, family, mm -hmm. joy, finances. So we can literally die in survival mode because the practices that we've adopted when we are at the heightened in the highest season of pain, we haven't let go of those things and we haven't relied upon our own strength to get us further. Hmm. Now that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. I like the analogy that you use with the oxygen machine and cause that's true. Cause it's kind of like, once you have this habit forming behavior yes. and you continue to do it, you can you do it. Mm -hmm. That's why I say, even now I subconsciously am like, I got to survive. I got to survive. And it's yeah. like, baby, you're making the most money you've ever Right. Made. Yes. Yes. In your life. And you don't need for nothing. Mm -hmm. And you're still somewhere in your yeah. head talking about, I got to survive. Yes. <laughs> survive. Yeah, and, it's, and it's so true. So many of us do it because it is, it's, it's just a trauma response, right? Um, clinging on to something, holding on to something so tightly. Because when we experience trauma, when you experience the relationship with your ex-husband going in the opposite direction, you didn't have control over it. Mm -hmm. And so you are telling yourself you had to have a false sense of control that if I overwork myself, I can never go back to this. Mm -hmm. If I only, you know, show up halfway in my relationship. I can never get hurt like that again. That is a false sense of control. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's me. And it's crazy because it's like the relationship I'm in now. Of course, we have our normal like ups and downs mm -hmm. like everybody does. But this has been like one of the best relationships I've been in. Like I couldn't mm -hmm. ask for a better partner. I couldn't ask for a better dad. Like I couldn't ask for a better just individual to put up with mm -hmm. me with all the stuff that came with me. And somewhere I'm still like hesitant yeah, because I feel like, like you, like I, you know, I get complaints sometimes about me not being all the way emotionally connected mm -hmm. because it's like, sometimes you seem withdrew Tiffany, yes. like it don't seem like you're here. And I'm like, yeah. And I admit that sometimes I am like that because some part of me is like, you ain't gonna get hurt if you don't put your feelings all the yeah. way right there. Like if your feelings mm -hmm. ain't all the way mixed in in that one, in that little area right here, like it ain't gonna hurt as much. And it really be causing more issues because it, it be causing problems. And, and this is what we're really doing. Let me tell you what you're really doing when you do that. You are allowing your ex-husband to still control your life from afar. Oh, I hate that that's even a statement. It's, that's the reality because you're saying, because you hurt me the way that you hurt me, and because I am committed to not allowing you to hurt me, I will withhold love from myself. That's crazy. All in the name of not allowing him to do it, you are telling yourself, 
I will receive less for the rest of my life. Mm. I don't want nobody had that type of control. <laughs> Man, we can put it like that for yeah. the rest of our life. The rest of your life. That's why you got to let it go. That's why you have to make a conscious effort to say, I am going to heal to the level of freedom. We talk about healing, but we don't talk about freedom. Yeah. Because when you are free, you allow what you've been through to strengthen you as a reference, but not as control. That's not freedom. I didn't invite you here to read me like this today or to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Real hot girl tip. All right, y'all. So this segment of the show is where we're going to go into bite-sized tips and tricks to help you re-enter into your hot girl or hot boy era. So on today's segment, we are going to talk about lighting for your pictures. All right. I know y'all watched Tyra on America's Next Top Model tell them girls left and right day one-ish. Okay, but we ain't going to be that mean to y'all. I'm not going to hold no envelopes. I ain't going to do y'all like that. But what we are going to talk about is the lighting for these selfies because, baby, what else runs the world besides social media? So make sure when you're taking your pictures that you are holding the light in front of you and not behind you because you can cause shadows and other things to come into your pictures that you don't want. So light in front, not directly in front. Sometimes you got to find the right lighting. Just make sure whoever's taking your picture is no shadow on your face or in weird parts of your body that can make you look bigger or just weird shaped. You know what I'm saying? So always make sure that light is right and tight and tell your people if they love you to take that picture right the first time. You know, get them angles. Get down. Get that lighting on you. If they ain't whipping out the light, baby, they don't love you. So if you need more lighting tips and tricks, I don't know what to tell you because I ain't going to have it for you. But you can head over to YouTube University. And I'm sure you can find some there. All right. Okay. All right, y'all. Thank y'all so much for tuning into this week's episode. Make sure that you comment and subscribe to the show. Also, go over and head over to the YouTube because, baby, that's where you're going to catch all the visuals. And while you're there, let us know what your favorite segment of the show is. And until next time, you guys be safe. I'm about to say something left, and I'm not about to redo this shit. So let me just throw another thank you wrap this shit up. <laughs> Therapy with Tiff. <laughs> like theme songs. <laughs> Real hot girl tip. All right, y'all. So this part of the show is where I'm going to start over. <laughs> I know y'all remember Tyra on America's Next Model. And baby, that's not the show. It was America's Next Top. <laughs> I see Steph look up at me like, baby, no, that wasn't it. Welcome to, nope, not that one. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, sorry, BJ. <laughs> All right. <laughs> BJ need to end that way. You ain't got to go home. You got to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, time to go. I'm like, oh, my God. Who did I sleep with? No, I'm joking. <laughs> Who is this woman? <laughs> Listen. I pull bitches on the weekend. Hey. After 5 o'clock on Friday to 2 o'clock on Sundays. <laughs> That's your bitch pulling time. That's my bitch pulling time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies, and go. <clears throat> Always have to give a delay because they be giggling and stuff after the claps. I don't know why. Y'all so did. Y'all was silent. I was surprised. She <laughs> <laughs> can't see me. I'm like, All right, here we go.